はい、ネームイスタダシウチノ、プロフェッショナルパフォーマンスタディウスアッ学習院ウェメンスコレッジ、東京、ジャパン。My topic is Robert Wilson and Japan, and I will explore the unique relationship between Robert Wilson and Japan. It is unique in the sense that Wilson's work has never been fully appreciated. Within Japan's theater culture, yet there is a strong sense of warm intimacy with his work among certain Japanese theater goers. The announcement that Wilson was awarded the prestigious 34th Premium Imperial Award Theater and Film Section in 2023. Hello, Then my name is Tadashi Uchino, a bit of a a professor of performance studies at Kakushu Japan. in Japan. Women's his College, representative Tokyo, have Japan. Not been widely seen here. My topic is Robert Wilson in Japan, According and I will explore the unique database, relationship the database between Robert Wilson and Japan. Performance record. It is unique in the Only sense that Wilson's work has never been work fully understood. appreciated Here's within Japan's theater the culture, yet yeah, there is a strong sense of warm intimacy with his work among certain Japanese mm, theater groups. The list actually is incomplete, and additionally, The announcement、uh, was that Wilson was awarded the prestigious 1994th Premium Imperial the Award in the film section in 2023, in the news came a bit as a bit of a surprise to many of us、Tokyo's、in Japan, as his representative works have not been widely seen here. An outside spectacle Uh, According to Waseda University Studio Museum database, the, the database of contemporary theatrical performance records, only seven、uh, of Worsen's works program, are listed. Which is made Here's the diff starting the, with the、uh, diff man class of 1982. This spectacle had more than the, one t h e list actually is incomplete. In addition,、uh, there was a swan song in 1990 with Japanese actors. Among Wilson's for the second Mitsui Art works, Festival both and Lecture of Nothing in, in 2019 for the ninth Theater Olympics at Toga Village. And additionally, Wilson was also chosen to create an outside spectacle in、uh, titled In the Evening at Koi Pond for the IT Expo in 2005. According to a、uh, Fuji television program, which was made for the、uh, receptions of the award, this spectacle had more than 1.4 million audience members. Among Wilson's full scale theatrical works, both in scale and numbers, Japan has seen only a few. Including Einstein on the Beach in 1992, Madame Butterfly in 1999, and Wojciech in 2003. Since then, none of his larger works have been performed in Japan. In terms of publications on Wilson in Japan, only one book in Japanese was published in 1987, a translation. Of the catalog originally published in 1984 by the Contemporary Art Center Cincinnati and the Bird Hoffman Foundation. Accordingly, academically, sorry, Wilson is not necessarily a favored subject according to SINI Research Index. Only 19 entries exist in Japanese. Four of which are my own. Why is this the case? One obvious reason for the scarcity of Wilson's work、uh, presence in Japan is the lack of public subsidies. It is very difficult for us to invite Wilson's larger works. While theoretical and socio cultural inquiries might also explain this phenomenon. I will not delve into them today due to the time constraints. Despite the general lack of interest in Wilson's work in Japan, some of his most inspiring small scale works have been witnessed over the past 40 years, 
beginning with Stefan Glantz in the first Toga International Theatre Festival in 18, 1982. On this occasion, Wilson came to a remote village of Toga and performed with Sugiura Chizuko, a female actor from Waseda Shogekijo, Waseda Little Theatre, now Scott, it's a Suzuki company of Toga. So Sugiura was uh, Suzuki company's uh, act, female actor. And two elementary school children from the village. Here's a short clip of the performance and an interview by Professor Takahashi Yasunari, who happened to be my academic mentor during, during my graduate school days. Uh, I'm aware that uh, any work of art refuses to be summarized, but uh, would it be possible for you to explain briefly uh, the basic idea or concept that you aim to create or convey in this piece? Well, <clears throat> the basic idea, I think, is that um, the piece be open-ended, that it not draw one conclusion, but uh, can be a catalyst for many ideas. Uh, it can be something one can contemplate. It's something one can uh, uh, watch the way one watches uh, when one goes to a park and sits on a bench and uh, daydreams, uh, the way you watch clouds or the way you watch a sunset the way you watch a, a pine tree that's gently blowing in the breeze, that <clears throat> it's hopefully of a time that's um, like nature. Mm -hmm. It's a natural time. And uh, so that one can watch the play and think about what is happening on the play, but the performer doesn't demand uh, the audience is primary attention, that the audience can uh, think about other things, can, uh, can daydream, can uh, uh, have space. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the, then the piece uh, is something that can stimulate one's thoughts and imagination. <coughs> when I first uh, performed this work, it was actually the first work I made in the theater. It was made in 1968. It wasn't performed until 1970. But um, when it was first performed, people said, obviously, that I was influenced by the No Theater. And I had never seen the No and wasn't, didn't know very much about it. So um, I wasn't influenced by it when I made the work. Here I work with a body. The subtitle says Robert Wilson, Deathman Glance. This is um, a a Professor Yasunari uh, Takahashi is uh, explaining in Japanese uh, some of the characteristics of the performance. It's, it's emphasizing the, uh, the minimalist uh, aspect of the work compared to the other uh, of Robert Wilson's work, which are gigantic in scale and technologically highly uh, motivated. And also, he also emphasizes 
もうミルクとナイフというもの,ものを象徴スーパー、スーパー、スーパー、スーパー、メディアの物語から、今日の新聞社会面の記事に至る、小殺しという行為の神話性。まあ、それから極端に引き延ばされた時間の非日常性と、まあ、そういったもので、えー、観客は得意な体験を味わうことで、yeah, この公演では、病気のため来日できなくなったアメリカの女優の代わりを、桜小劇場の杉浦千鶴君が、and, and ま、子役は、ドラマの小学生が演じていまた。The,、uh, the performance was well received, and it is especially noteworthy that a long established standing friendship between Wilson and Suzuki Tadashi, the director, was established during the festival. This friendship, which warrants a theoretical analysis, can be compared to the relationship between Tago and Tenshin Okakura, Okakura Kakuzo, or Okakura Tenshin. Uh, the very famous Indian and Japanese figures who had a very interesting relationship、uh, in the time of the modernization of both India and, and Japan, which,、uh, about which the Rastum Balucha, the、uh, Silver Edition, had written a book called Another Asia. We will come back to that issue a little bit later、uh, at the, the end of my talk. And,、uh, but their encounter here had brought them to, to work on the,、uh, the, the famous project of civil wars、uh, that the tree is best、uh, down, tree is best,、uh, best measured when it is down in 1984. And there was a workshop in Tokyo which、um, featured some of Suzuki's、uh, actors in Waseda Show Geki Show. And also, note,、uh, which is more interesting, is perhaps. That they, they featured the new actor, Kanze Hideo, as one of the members of、uh, uh, one of the cast members. There is a documentary film directed by Howard、uh, Bruckner, and、uh, probably I think that there is a, the,、uh, you, it is accessible still, and you can see the Japanese section,、uh, how it went in that film. The friendship between Wilson and Suzuki continued with the framework of theater festivals in,、um, in 1988. Wilson returned with his、uh, new play for the first Mitsui Festival, an art festival held by annually until 1996, for which Suzuki was the artistic director. Suzuki invited Wilson back for the next Mitsui Festival in 1990. Where an, an intercultural collaboration was realized. The Japanese version of the production Swan Song featured two actors from, Japanese, from Japan. One was Maru Akaji, a famous Budo dancer from Dai Rakudakan, and Suzuki Ryozen, a former Waseda Shogeki Jo Suzuki's company member, who、uh, left the company actually when Suzuki moved his.、Uh, Center of activity from Tokyo to Toga Village. Einstein on the Beach for the opening of Art Fair Theater in Tokyo seems to be a happy exception as Japan finally was witnessed one of his、uh, larger works. The performance were, was well received by a broader audience as it was staged in metropolitan Tokyo area. However, the reception of Wilson's work remained a transient event, partly due to the、uh, coincidental environments of the time, which means that the theater was a, was a kind of a commercial venue that high art audiences, high art audiences, or connoisseurs of high art or serious art, for that matter, are not really expecting to go. But the friendship between Wilson and Suzuki continued as Suzuki, along with some other、uh, of his closer allies in world theater, initiated the Theater Olympics in 1994. Robert Wilson was one of the members of the committee 
Ra who organizes the Seattle Olympics since then. Suzuki was appointed the artistic director of Shizuoka Art Theater in 1995, uh, with the uh, exact title actually was a general director of a Shizuoka Performing Arts Center. The Wilson Suzuki friendship reached another peak in 1999 in Shizuoka when he brought two works to Shizuoka Hamlet, a monologue, and Madame Butterfly. Again, the, uh, against the regular rule, the, the latter, the, the opera, did not tour other cities in Japan and could only be seen in Shizuoka. Well, actually, it was in uh, Hamamatsu City, which is a, a bit far from the uh, Shizuoka City where the Suzuki Theater is. But still, uh, I, I remember that the theater was full, uh, watching finally the, the first opera that uh, Wilson directed in, in Japan. Suzuki invited Hamlet a monologue again the following year in Shizuoka, where Suzuki started the new festival in the springtime. After that, until 2016, the only work Wilson brought to Japan was Wojciech in 2003. It was not Suzuki. Maybe he, he might have been involved, but the main body for invitation was so-called the Japan Culture Foundation. And it, the foundation was very active during the 1990s, introducing the cutting-edge European theater or dance production to Japan. And Pina Bausch um, and William Forsyth and Frank Rude Palais were the regular uh, visitor, unlike Robert Wilson, to Japan. In fact, the Pina Bausch was coming to Japan almost every year in the 1990s. So the Wojciech, I think, I could, uh, as, as a production, uh, in terms of the financial side, it was not a success. I remember, I don't have a, the exact figure, but I remember that the, the theater was quite empty and because many of the people didn't know who Robert Wilson was. Although some serious audience members were actually there, seeing the, the, the second big work that Wilson brought after uh, Einstein on the beach in about almost more than 10 years ago in 1992. Before uh, returning to Toga in 2019, uh, Wilson created a rather exceptional outdoor spectacle as oh, I told, uh, oh, I already mentioned about that, but the uh, for the IG Expo in 2000 and, and, and 2005. And its concept is as it, it's written in the slide, visual and musical show based on themes of earth, life, civilization, and the future. As the ecology, it was one of the big issues for the IG Expo back in 2005. And as I said, the audience, uh, regular audience and just went to the expo, saw the performance. So 1.43 million people saw the performance. It is a video clip from a special program that Fuji Television Network aired on November 17, 2023, and on BS Fuji on December 3rd, 2023, when we, uh, Wilson was awarded the uh, that 34th premium in Petty Area World. It is also seven minutes, it is almost all seven minutes long and includes an explanation of the reasons for Wilson's uh, receiving the award. Spectacle. The 
宇宙人類の文明さらに過去から未来まで祝福するという壮大なイメージを形にしたもの143万人もの観客が魅了されましたこのイベントを生み出した人こそウィルソンさんなのです彼の芝居には独特の演出がありますこの演出は独特の演出がありますタイトル2015年に上演されたアダムの受難およそ90分間一言もセリフがありませんアアアアアアアア40数年前初めて見た彼の舞台を忘れられないというのが日本を代表する演劇評論家松岡和子さんですもうちょっとびっくり仰天でしたね。セリフなし。で、動きは超スローモーション。ということで、なんかこう舞台芸術のこう私たちが持ってた先入観というものをもう完全にひっくり返したっていう。一体なぜ沈黙にこだわるようになったのでしょうか。ウィルソンさんはアメリカ・テキサス州に生まれました。大学を卒業後、27歳で劇団を立ち上げます。その頃出会った一人の少年が、いわゆる沈黙の演劇のヒントとなったといいます。そその革新的な舞台にいち早く目をつけた日本人がいました。1973年から続く富山県戸賀芸術公園6つの劇場を備え毎年夏に国際演劇祭を開催世界中の演劇人が訪れる演劇の聖地とも呼ばれていますおよそ40年前この地にウィルソンさんは招聘され、沈黙の演劇を披露したのです。招聘した人物、それが。ただし続き、ミスス、ただし。寺山とここでね、社会見やった。寺山修司と磯崎は。都賀芸術公演を拠点に活動する演出家、鈴木忠さん。寺山修司、唐十郎らとともに。1960年代に起こった新しい演劇運動を牽引していましたヨーロッパ近代が確立した演劇スタイルそういうものに対してまあ批判的な動きが日本でも起こったわけですそのねアメリカのにも何人かいたんですけど一緒にいるんですけどその中でね一番早く突出して出てきたのが1982年ベルマドリスト1982年世界6カ国から演劇人を招待して開催した国際演劇祭ウィルソンさんはろう者の眼差しという1時間を超える無言劇を上演しました。夫婦が子供にミルクを与えた後ナイフで刺すだけのシーンをスローモーションで演じたこの芝居は日常的に見えているものを全く異なった回路で示したと評されたのですこの時初めて彼の芝居を見た鈴木さん無言であること以外に強烈に印象に残ったことがあるといいますこの指一つに照明当てるとずっと照明係に注文をつけるわけですよ。そうするとね何日もかかる。だからね、でもそのこだわりって分かるんですよね、舞台見るとそういう。が出てきた時に指だけがバーッと。何ていうの
あのボーセン舞台を作る時の執念みたいなねその執念が舞台制作の常識も覆していました2019年。ウィルソンさんは37年ぶりにこの芸術公演で舞台を披露しました照明のこだわりは変わらず本番ギリギリまでリハーサルを繰り返したといいますウィルソンさんは主演を務めましたこだわったのはテーブルのグラスに強く当てた照明グラスも役者のような存在感を放ちますまるで一枚の絵のような美しい場面から観客は多くのことを感じ取るのですウィルソンさんが信じる芸術それは言葉だけでなくあらゆる壁を越える力を持つのですウィルソンさんが信じる芸術それは言葉だけでなく Okay, so this is Ninth Theater Olympics, and it was held in St. Petersburg and Toga in 2019. And Wilson came to Toga to perform、um, almost a sort of work, Lecture on Nothing. There's a very interesting and sentimental connection between the two theater giants, Wilson and Suzuki, at Toga. I was there to witness not only his performance and its enthusiastic reception by the audience, but also the informal interactions between the two on many occasions during Wilson's stay in Toga. Suzuki invited Wilson on his private home in Toga, and they engaged in nonchalant conversational dialogue during the reception.、Um, Reception hours before and after the performance. This experience reminded me of the book that、uh, one of my closest friends, Rustum Baluchi, wrote. I already told you about that. Another Asia is the very interesting relationship between Tagore and Okakura in modernizing India and Japan. And I'm actually right now engaged in a book project of, I'm supposed to、uh, write a monograph in Japanese on Robert Wilson. And it can be a general book. I'm in, more interested in focusing the issue of the friendship.、Uh, friendship is, is a very tricky word, actually.、Uh, it can, you know,、uh, We were just in the midst of something they called a, a big tropical storm, not quite a hurricane. So it's been, it's been a real mess, I guess, in New York as, as well.、Um, I'm, I'm a little,、um, something just happened also this morning that was,、um, I'd been working towards, when I was sort of given this topic, I, I, I'm not really a specialist in Norway, by the way. <laughs> It's,、uh, But I, I've become、uh, much more so since May when I found out about、uh, this, when Frank and I talked out about it in Berlin.、Um, and,、uh, but I reached out and made a bunch of、uh, you know, inquiries to, to various people. And、uh, many, of them, many of them have just been coming in, as I suspected, because 
as you know, people in in the Nordic countries love their summer, and uh, they're very hard to um, to reach. But just this morning, um, for whatever reason, I um, got access to the video of Etta, uh, which uh, I had not seen, uh, and was only available in um, very short clips. And uh, there's not a, a good English translation of uh, of Fossa's script. I talked to him in person. He said there's there's not. Um, so um, I didn't talk in person. I, I, I spoke with him um, about that. But um, so that has really changed everything about what what this paper will eventually be. So I just wanted to let I mean, I've I've learned so much this morning that I was not able to incorporate uh, because literally just received that that uh, that video, which is quite really wonderful. If you've not seen it, uh, if if you if you weren't able to see Etta, it's frankly one of the best um, Wilson pieces that I can remember seeing, and I've seen uh, many of them. Let me try to just uh, I might summarize some of this because I don't want to. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of of how. Your knowledge of, of Wilson's work in Norway, how much you might know, and I don't want to, uh, you know, bore you by any means if, if in this long concert uh, conference. But um, I just titled this Robert Wilson and Norway uh, because I, I think that that and is and is um, is important in, in in that title. As Wilson's work, as Robert Wilson's work became an important part of European theater in the late 1970s and 80s, theater companies from Northern Europe and Scandinavia began to show interest and in commissions from major state theaters followed. The first recorded production of a work by Wilson in Scandinavia was the 1998 production of Strindberg's A Dream Play at Et Drumspiel in Stockholm. Several per, uh, productions were commissioned in Denmark during the early 2000s, including Wojtek and The Black Rider, both of which played at the Betty Nansen Teatret. Um, in 2002, a special production entitled White Town was commissioned by the Bellevue Teatret for the recognition of the life and career of Danish artist Arne Jakobsen. The first production of a Wilson work to appear in Norway was the 2005 Peer Gant, and I'm going to use the pronunciation Peer Gant and not attempt some Norwegian product, uh, pronunciation that I won't sound authentic using. Um, commissioned by Det Norske Teatret in Oslo. The production would later transfer to co-producer Det Noya Sena in Bergen before touring to the Brooklyn Academy of Music in New York City. Three other productions by Wilson have also played in Norway. Edda at uh, Det Norske Teatret in March 2017, Shakespeare's Sonnets later in May of that same year, and The Sandman in 2019 at the Bergen Theater Festival. And we'll talk about one more production that didn't happen um, later. This um, essay will explore the nature of Wilson's productions in Norway, as well as the relationship um, in Wilson's aesthetic, aesthetic and certain aspects of Norway's social and cultural nature. And frankly, some of that is still a work in process since I'm just now hearing back from um, some of the people who are returning from their, their summer break. The legacy of Ibsen and the tradition of both realistic and non-realistic versions of his plays in Norway is well documented and both traditions are ongoing. Peer Gant is the most often produced work by Wilson, by Ibs, uh, Ibsen or anyone else in Norway. The long history of production of the work includes ballets, operas, plays, children's plays, films, and undoubtedly other types of performances not mentioned. As noted in the extensive paper, Robert Wilson's Staging of Peer Gant and the Norwegian Tradition by Keld Hildig, um, the work has maintained three basic characteristics throughout its long production history. An extensive use of Norwegian sceneries, the author's words, lyrical mood creating music and recognizable and thus natural representations of Norwegian characters. Throughout the link, throughout its lengthy history, Peer Gant gained the reputation as being representative of the, of the Norwegian way of life and grew to represent all things Norwegian as it explores over 50 years of action. 
As it predated strictly realistic staging, Peer Gant was never bound to a particular approach, nor was it relegated to a lower status as, as one of Ibsen's early plays. The play's exploration of the working class naturally led it to numerous Brecht-inspired productions in the 1970s, but most experts point to Ingmar Bergman's staging in 1957 at Malmo City Theater as being the via negativa of a new psycho-surreal approach whereby much of the play's action occurred in Peer's subconscious. Bergman's approach realized the play is an internal struggle where Peer seeks to find his, his own humanity and paved the way for numerous highly visual yet uniquely Norwegian productions that emphasized the music and folklore of the 19th century in addition to exploring various theatrical means um, as storytelling devices. Wilson's visionary staging certainly landed as a, ne as a necessary sector in, in the tradition, in the trajectory of that work. Wilson's Piergent began rehearsals in March 2003 at the Watermill Center in Long Island, New York, USA. The Watermill Workshop production yielded an extensive set of drawings or project book for Piergent, as well as a staged collection of physical images developed by participants in the Watermill Summer Program and set to music by composer Mikael Galasso. Practical work began later that year at Det Norske Teatret in Oslo. Apparently, Wilson had conceived the work in typically massive scale, and the initial drawings and other speculations had yielded a potential running time of eight hours or more. As is the norm with commissioned productions of this nature, the extended rehearsal period was one year. Several months would be devoted to table work as images and ideas were further workshopped in a group atmosphere by numerous individuals like actors, dramaturgs, and others involved in the process. From that table work, the skeleton structure known as the silent play emerged. Elements such as architecture, light, and all other visual elements were contemplated and considered. Actors from both Det Norske Teatret in Oslo, as well as Det National Scene in Bergen were selected to supplement the skeleton cast and the full cast had been finalized some six months prior to the opening. The final stage, which lasted only around one month, consisted of the addition of the text to the work. For Pierre Gant, that Norske Teatret had contracted Norwegian playwright Jan Fossa in order to create a new text for the work that was more up-to-date and less wordy as pre previous versions had been. In its initial form, Pier Gant includes some 40 scenes and locations from all over the globe and includes both the subconscious and subconscious, the conscious and subconscious worlds. Typical of most of Ibsen's works, Pier Gant was written in Old Norwegian, and Foss's goal was to write the text in a new Norwegian, a language that included dialects from four prominent regions of Norway. And these quotes are all from Jan Fossa, who was very kind to when I wrote to his agent and wrote me back not just little short uh, bits of information, but literally pages uh, of information about his experience working with Bob Wilson. And I was very thankful and felt that he was very kind to do that in the midst of his summer. Um, Fossa noted that the, uh, that, that, the old, that the original was written in an, what he called an old-fashioned Norwegian that in reality was Danish. He said, it, he said it was quite a job to adapt the work, but he felt that it made the work fresher and in his opinion made Ibsen's uh, greatness as a writer more visible. Fossa also noted that Bob Wilson has a great ear for the music of language, so the actors delivered their lines in an almost perfect way. It was impressive. Critics, even those known for more traditional tastes, noted that both Wilson and Fossa had preserved the text and the play's overall meaning and impact with a strong measure of success. In discussing, in further uh, discussions about his collaboration with Wilson, Fossa noted that they never actually did collaborate. Fossa noted, I delivered a text and he, Wilson, cut it. 
But Foster stated that he deeply admired Wilson's talent for understanding a language that he didn't understand. And those were Foster's words. He didn't understand them in a normal way, he said. Most of the production textual cutting and adaptation was done by dramaturg Monica Olsen, who had worked with Wilson previously in Sweden and Denmark. Fossett noted he was impressed with Wilson's ability to successfully substitute a deeply meaningful theatrical language for his written text. After the success of Peer Gint, Det Norske Teatret had the desire to present another work directed by Wilson with a text by Fossett. For this work, Fossett was asked to provide a version of the Eddic poems, Icelandic manuscripts from the 13th and early 14th centuries. Wide ranging in their subject matter, the Eddic poems are essentially pre-Christian literary works that deal with Norse gods and legends and handle many important events such as the beginning of time, um, the naming of the gods, and other things. Um, and again, since I just saw it, I'm, yes, it does. And, and uh, I would be able to add more to this. Vasa noted that he wrote the work trying at the same time to be loyal to the originals, but also making a what he called a coherent play. Edda had its world premiere in Oslo at, at Det Norske Teatret in March 2017. Music by Arvo Pert with the uh, duo Coco Rosie and the costumes were designed by Jacques Reynaud. And I would admit, uh, mention that one of the most striking things about it, the Edda, was the use of those two styles of music and the way they, that, that they both blended together. And so as I develop this, I would, would like to talk more about that. As is the case with all things Robert Wilson, all roads typically lead to Anne Kristen Roman. Having worked as Wilson's assistant director for over two decades, Ms. Roman has been a key figure in all performance and design elements of Wilson's performances since their initial collaboration in 1983 with the Civil Wars. She was kind enough to talk to me as well as we have spoken a few times previously. She noted that Wilson likes to consider works that are very close and important to particular societies and cultures. He then likes to examine them in different ways to find humor in the works, to what she said called is unseat the works from their high place and then look at them in a more playful yet introspective way. In considering Wilson's work on Etta, Roman noted, Bob has also always been drawn to universal myths. For example, Ilegalio, the creation myth the people of Sulawesi, um, Wagner's The Ring Cycle, and the story of the Nibelungen, Homer's The Odyssey, Goethe's Faust, and of course, Ibsen's Peer Gent. These works all include the themes of good versus evil, incest, weird creatures like trolls and the Cyclops, and they all tell stories that are relevant for all mankind. Good with time. Um, Certain elements of the Nordic myths were particularly appealing to Wilson. A study of the scene breakdown with Roman and Carl Morton Admans, Amundsen, dramaturg of the De, De Norske Teatret and a member of the Edda dramaturgical team, revealed a number of scenes where many of the Norse gods would come together for meetings and have to remind Ovid, the all-father and god of war and death, about some occurrence or event that he had forgotten. Wilson, uh, in, in her discussions, and Christine said, Wilson discussed his old age related conditions, Odin's old age related conditions as being similar to those of humans who um, become more childlike and silly as they grow older. A number of comic nonsense dances were given to Odin. And there was also a scene in which Odin tested death himself by hanging upside down, which I finally saw today. And um, in early table work, Wilson had imagined Odin hanging upside down, singing a rock song, and remains in that hanging position for nine days to do some, what uh, Anne Christine called, inner searching. Another important scene involved Odin's son, 
Tor and his meeting with Volva and the accidental severing of the Midgard storm, uh, Volva's companion and the snake who holds the worlds together with the amazing puppet work that they were able to achieve in that era. To connect these major events, Wilson created an, a number of knee plays, as is the case with the Civil Wars. Um, and I would retract that statement now, having actually seen it. There are um, there's some case of, of that, but not 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 really. Um, yeah. Um, to and then of course I would have to. I need to rewrite because again I'm. Now I just have this production fresh in my mind and it's so wonderful. I want to say so much more about it. Two additional works have appeared in Norway as of August, 2024. Shakespeare's Sonnets in May, 2017 and The Sandman in 2019. Both appeared as part of the Bergen Theater Festival uh, at the um, performance space Grieg Holland, which is Norway's largest cultural and Congress uh, venue. Um, I think in the sake of time, we can, um, I'm, I'm going to move forward with some of this, but just note that the uh, um, the Sandman was Wilson's first collaboration with uh, the British pop star Anna Calvi, notorious for her, her wonderful soundtracks and Peaky Blinders and many other dark film projects. And the, um, the, the Norwegian uh, public and critics have, um, because of these works now the, with the darker theme, um, the the public has come up with a word for these 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 works, with, uh, and they call them the uncanny or weird works, the uhi uhigaligia, uhigaligia works, these dark works by by uh, Bob Wilson and uh, Vegard Vinga, which of course they're, they're quite uh, quite used to. One final aspect of Wilson's work in Norway is his association with the Norwegian Theater Academy in Friedrichstadt about one hour from Oslo. Wilson has a long time association with Serge von Arx, a professor of scenography and practicing, and, and also a practicing architect. Arx and Wilson began collaborating as early as 1989 on various stage, exhibition, and design projects all over the world, including the Berliner Ensemble, Teatro alla Scala, Teatro Real, and many others as noted on Profe Professor Arx's website. Wilson and Arx have long experimented with performing architecture, in which the elements of performance and architecture have become permanently intertwined in performance. The idea, of course, is reminiscent of Russian artist and theorist Meyerhold and many others who've utilized constructivism and similar performance practices that involve the melding of humans and scenic elements in their performance. In their work together, Wilson and Arx, they have found it important to utilize specific materials unique to each work that are intrinsic to the particular worlds. For example, in Edda, von Arx noted that the set is a partner with the dialogue when everything else that is happening on stage. Wilson's work has a long tradition of including visual quotes and references to pre-existing images and structures. In Edda, one recurring image uh, is that of the Brion complex by Italian architect Carlo Scarpa. Von Arx noted that recognizable visual structures assist in communicating ideas. If you have something that people know or that they can recognize, says Arx, it's much easier to pull them together and to pull them into the performance. Another uh, Scandinavian or Norwegian element noted by Arx was the use of traditional building methods and materials such as native woods, paint textures, and the superior craftsmanship that Norway is known for. Scenic elements were developed in the same manner as all other elements of performance and were discussed on a daily basis, which would allow for changes in accordance with the evolution of the staging process. Um, outside, many, uh, outside of Europe, many companies are not able to manage the many changes that are inherent in a work by, by Wilson. Um, let me mention this last thing because I, again, just saw it today. Um, Wilson's works are well known for having many anachronistic and very personal references, both in the spoken text as well as notable visual references. In Edda, there was a scene in which the character Tor had to, well, 
it, it, yeah, had to make a quick getaway after making advances on Freya, who refuses to marry him because he is a troll. Now that I've seen it, I think there's a little bit of confusion in those in those characters. But uh, Thor makes his exit at, with a there's a, a scene with a cowboy hat and a boot. One of uh, Wilson's playful re references to his home state, of course, of Texas. It was noted by um, assistant director Roman that Bob's life and work have always referenced Texas. For many of the first years that I knew him, he would only wear his signature cowboy boots. She also noted that in many cases, she could sense the majesty of the Texas sky in his landscape and lighting designs. In particular, in particular the hues and textures of the Texas sunset had been um, etched into Wilson's memory and thus became prevalent into a lot of his designs. And this element was, was present in Etta as the hints and hues of the landscapes were much more reminiscent of a Texas sky than an, the Norway sky or anywhere in, in Scandinavia. Um, unfortunately, a potential collaboration on Moby Dick with Det Norske Teatret did not materialize. The long planned staging of Hemingway's masterpiece, however, moved towards a fall production at the Dusseldorf Schausville House, which they're working on right now. And um, as of this writing, there were no planned collaborations for Wilson in, in Norway outside of those with the Norwegian Theater Academy. However, given Norway's extensive national funding for arts and culture, it's hard to imagine commissions will not be forthcoming. And thank you. That's that's what I have. Um, I'm sorry. It was it's a little rough, um, and it's been a long 48 hours to me with uh, about three hours sitting in a plane that didn't take off. So thank you, Steve. Can can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I think we probably still have four or five minutes for, I don't know, two or three questions from the audience, if there's anyone who has a question. Um, this is a bit of a technical question, uh, but why weren't you able to see uh, Ada until today? Yeah, well, um, I, I had requested it from um, the uh, from Watermill and... Um, other play there, there evidently was not a, a, a is not a recording available the, to my knowledge that I was able to find, um, and uh, the um, the people from Det Norske Teatret uh, through forwarding mail it literally arrived in my mailbox just today, uh, and she she wrote me a letter and said you were right because uh, in my um, in my letter to her I said I understand it's summer and I understand how people in uh, Northern Europe are very um, attached to their summer and, and, and they and, and won't break away from it. But uh, if you could send this to me, please. And the, she said, she acknowledged that was a fact and, and, and that they had been away on vacation. Perhaps one final question. Does anyone have a, a question? Yoni? Uh, it's not really a question, but I was in Norway in 2006, 2007. So just for your information, you know, we're in a conference. Um, Wilson's production of Lady from the Sea, the Polish version of it, was um, done as part of the Ibsen Festival in 2006. So Norwegians did see that production um, of his play. Um, I, th I thought, you know, if you're creating a chronology of the production that have been seen there, that's another one to do. I really appreciate that. We were uh, when I was when I spoke with. Uh, with Anne Christine and other people, uh, she we, we went through what we thought were all the, all those done there, but that may have, I'll, I'll uh, I will check on that and and try to find some information about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Steve, uh, you know, of course, sorry that you weren't able to join us today. I hope uh, the weather won't be as bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Almost all Wilson scholars know our next speaker. Uh, he is a writer, archivist, scholar, historian, and concert presenter living in the Hudson Valley. From 
2013 until the end of 2023, he was the lead archivist and director of archives for the Watermill Center. Please welcome Clifford Allen. We might have to wait longer. Let me see. It's a little bit of a uh, technical moment. Okay. Yeah, it's a technical moment. <laughs> but I can throw it over to you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, it should be all right. It should. Oh, sure. I think it's a different. That's what's with the USB. It's also just pretty my email address. Yes, it's all. Yeah. I'll let you do that. <laughs> this is an experimental performance. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, so just a little bit about uh, me and the archives. Um, while we wait to get a, an, an adapter. Um, so I started working with, uh, with Bob in the archives in 2013. Um, I actually did, I have a background in archives, but not necessarily a background in Robert Wilson. So um, my first exposure to Bob in this wonderful wild circus of, uh, of artists and collaborators and his world, his theatrical world uh, came after an education in music and art history as well as archival science. So un unlike previous archivists, uh, he had a long, long, long career of archival collaborators going back to the late 1960s uh, with Robin Brentano, uh, one of the early Bird Hoffman School of Birds founding members who collected numerous uh, numerous materials related to Bob and his work starting in 1969 with the founding of the Bird Hoffman Foundation. Uh, well up through the 1980s and 1990s, there were always people accumulating stuff uh, around Bob. So there was an incredible legacy of paper. Um, this is something that, that uh, Bob saw very early on as important to his work, uh, his, his creation of work, his remounting of work, and the scholarship around his work, he's never really been without a, a large amount of physical uh, Im imprinting of the theatrical productions uh, and, and artistic works that, uh, that fill his world. Um, so up until 2013, uh, there, were, there was kind of a, a rotating cast of archivists. I was the first in many years who came from an actual archival science background. Um, and part of that was in service of a new initiative to develop a digital library and digital archives platform that would bring together a range of collections, both uh, visual art, uh, library books, and archival material at the Watermill Center. Um, so initially I was brought in as a processing archivist because I had experience with that, but uh, quite quickly began to develop alongside Deb Verhoff, the librarian, uh, and a number of other uh, part-time staff, a, a vision for an archival uh, center at Watermill and in New York. The archives were mostly based at 29th Street in Midtown, but 
recently have relocated to, uh, to Watermill. Um, let's see, so we're a, we were a small team at that time. Um, our initiatives were very large, however, and focused towards access. Um, as a lead archivist, my role shifted from bringing together a copious amount of physical material around Bob and his work uh, to this digital archives interface. Ooh, I see a, an object coming towards me from Frank. This is wonderful. Beautiful. So here we go. Look at that. Oh, beautiful. So yes. So my 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 interest was in access. Um, I certainly began began as an analog person. Uh, that was my training, but slowly but surely began to uh, encompass di the digital realm. Um, Bob's work is still not super well known in his home country, much less uh, uh, numerous other locales. Um, the availability of, of materials is also something that Bob and his collaborators constantly need, uh, often uh, within seconds of conceiving that they might need it. And uh, Bob and his collaborators certainly need historical access uh, to, or access to historical work going back to the early 1960s as well as uh, recently created works uh, that are still in the process of being formed. Uh, there were over 400 Robert Wilson productions that I cataloged uh, as well as creating alphanumeric codes uh, to denote which, which productions somebody was looking at um, and develop a from gestation or from sketch to press or scholarship uh, tree of how these works evolved, something that had not been done before 2013. So yeah, it's, it's a central structure that we had to develop, uh, bringing together materials from disparate locations uh, to develop an understanding of what the production archives would look like. Uh, this is the uh, cataloging interface for the productions themselves. There are similar interfaces for the Bird Hoffman School of Birds papers, the uh, exhibition records, uh, the production photographs, uh, the lecture records, uh, and we're still working through Watermill, uh, the Watermill Center's records and other Robert Wilson activities. He's a living artist. Uh, he doesn't stop. So this is uh, an archive that is constantly evolving, uh, but this is as much of a frame as we could put around it in the in the uh, beginning years. So we get an idea of uh, of what this looks like here. And uh, Ka Mountain, you can see, uh, is is what one of many productions that is very well represented. And we've talked about a little bit. And here is uh, a note, an archival node of a sketchbook that uh, centers on Ka Mountain and Gardenia Terrace, a story of some people and of a of some of a man and some people changing, or a family and some people changing. Sorry. Um, so this is accessible publicly, though there are capabilities to attach digital record digital objects to these records. Um, one would have to, at this point, request materials to, to view. You can't necessarily look at the entirety of a sketchbook at this time uh, through the archive space interface, but the materials are accessible to uh, qualified researchers and scholars, and certainly uh, we can occasionally scan on demand as well. Uh, a, a large part of the the archival initiative that I've been, I and my co colleagues have worked towards is the Library of Inspiration. This is a term that Bob has used for many years. Um, starting in 2012, it really became a reality. Uh, at first, an idea for an underground library, but uh, that in, in swampy Long Island is a little bit insane. So uh, we, we decided to try to make this living library uh, virtual and uh, connect materials in the art collection, the archives, uh, activities at Watermill, our book library, uh, through metadata, 
and understanding the connections between and visualizing the connections between uh, these disparate uh, collections to give a, a greater heft to their interrelationships. Um, it was rolled out in 2017 as a beta, uh, beta website utilizing a digital asset management system and a uh, wireframe website that, that I'll show you in a second uh, that, that dr draws these co collections together. Um, archives, our, our artists on-site and, and off-site could access materials this way. We learned during the COVID pandemic that it was a great tool for uh, virtually resident artists uh, who are in their home countries on lockdown to be able to uh, sandbox and access uh, digital materials around the archives and play with uh, relationships between those objects. Um, we're rolling out a 2.0 version this year that will have a much more robust interface. Uh, it's not gonna necessarily draw from a number of different websites and uh, try to, through uh, alphanumeric keys, like bring them together, but actually it's something that is a uh, mul multi-function uh, platform that one can just sandbox, create, and, and study relationships in one space rather than an in a more inefficient model. Um, this is the digital asset management system we were using. That's a Basil Langton photo of Ka Mountain and Gardenia Terrace in process, a seven day, 168 uh, hour play that, that was an early uh, inspiration for me and Bob Wilson. Uh, how can somebody this make a work this crazy and this fascinating? Uh, and he, he and his birds did it. So all of the metadata that you see on the right uh, was called from being able to, to process the actual papers uh, of the, uh, and photographs of the production and understand who's in it, when it took place, what it is, uh, and, then, uh, uh, and then add to the, the imagery with that, with that copious amount of information. So Widen was the name of our previous dams. Um, it was super easy to use, super to share images uh, around the world to Bob, his collaborators, artists, scholars, et cetera. Um, however, it was a little bit cumbersome at times. Uh, it didn't host video or audio, of which we have tons, and was not necessarily, uh, because of space limitations of the, the platform itself, able to be hosted. Uh, nevertheless, it did support linkages between uh, individuals, their, their roles within works, uh, theaters, uh, photographers, and related co collaborators, so one could really see the network and the sort of uh, broad field of interaction that, that Bob's work begets. Uh, this is the, uh, the library of inspiration as it existed until the end of 2023, as we're, as I said, we're rolling out a, a different platform that will not, be not dissimilar to Widen, but a bit more dynamic. Um, you could search, for example, uh, Christopher Knowles, a uh, collaborator of Bob since 1973 and his various uh, relationships to Bob and the Watermill Center and the art collection. You see his red dot cone. You see that he was in Einstein on the Beach, uh, Dialogue, uh, Letter for Queen Victoria, and he was also re uh, art, a resident artist at the center many times since uh, 1992, actually. Um, and then if you were to click through on Einstein on the, on the Beach, you would find a synopsis of the play. You would, you would uh, see the collaborators uh, of Bombs that were involved in the work um, and the, the Bert Hoffman Foundation, of course, um, and the alphanumeric code 1976 EOB. Anytime you click through one of those names, it would take you to anything that they were in turn involved with and kind of a a, uh, a deer run, as, as we say, of, of uh, collaborations and of, of depth. Um, so we're, we're now working out on the 2.0 version of this library of inspiration. Um, so like I said, it, it, it mer allowed a merger of, of, of a lot of variously siloed collections that previously didn't talk to one another and allowed artists to see those relationships um, at the center while they are in residence doing their work for say three to six weeks. Um, you could also sort using Google AI by color and see a, a field of, of, of green, uh, green art artifacts of landscapes uh, around Watermill of Robert Wilson Productions. Uh, you could also uh, use Google AI and it's very rudimentary uh, stage to see 
um, say, a, a term like gesture, and then you would find a whole bunch of images that had various kinds of gestures as well as drawings and so forth. So it was a very playful environment for individuals to study. They could make what is called a project book and collate uh, kind of a mood board of imagery relating to their research. Um, it, it was and is a key part of the uh, resident artists and scholars experiences at Watermill. Um, and we discovered that most of our, uh, many of our artists in residence and, and scholars in residence made great use of it as a platform despite some limitations. It, is a, it was a very dynamic um, way to study Bob and the center and their relationships. So we, we, we've heard this phrase a few times before. Um, on the left side of that image, this is the Watermill Center, um, and the, you see the, the knee, knee building uh, linking the two parts of what uh, was once a Western Union facility that Bob has converted, Bob eventually uh, raised and converted into a space of artistic study, uh, creation, and uh, collaboration. So the bottom left of that image was the former dorms. Uh, that is now occupied by the Robert Wilson Study Center. So, uh, oops. So, yeah, there's over a, a thousand linear feet of manuscripts and 30 terabytes plus of digital materials related to Bob and his productions alone, that's not including necessarily the Watermill Center uh, collaborators archives that we are slowly uh, accumulating as well, uh, and numerous other related materials, not to mention his uh, 10,000 volume book library and 8,000 uh, artifact collection. So the Robert Wilson papers were primarily held in New York City, actually just a stone's throw from here on West 20, 29th Street and an offsite storage on Long Island place called Bohemia, which is not very Bohemian. Uh, a good deli sandwich out there for sure though. Um, so we focus primarily on the uh, production manuscripts and trying to bring the manuscripts and photographs together from Bob's, from Bob's creative works going back to the 1960s. Uh, predominantly on Long Island, we have the Watermill Center archives and we had uh, papers related to uh, uh, Bob's uh, correspondent relationships with individuals outside of his productions, uh, large poster collection, things like that. Um, we ha now have the space to bring together these, um, these vast, vast collections. So that's what it looked like in NYC. Not, Bob never went back there, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> and we see Stephanie Engeln's uh, rendering of the uh, dor dormitories and a Bob drawing of what the space would look like. And now in situ, uh, Lauren DiGiulio on the left uh, studying and the beginning of the production archives there to the right, which wrap around in this nice bright light space. So yes, the impetus to collect has informed Bob and his work and defines how we approach the legacy uh, there's a continual building of, of work on previous work and researching and creating alongside all of these vast cultural resources, uh, artistic production is very unique for the artists as well as the scholars and the staff as well. Um, just to get, give an idea of this building, uh, building on previous work uh, scenario, we see an image of Deaf Man Glance to the right with Cheryl Sutton and Cheryl Sutton, uh, or on the left, with Cheryl Sutton and on the right, Cheryl again uh, a year later in Calm Mountain and Gardenia Terrace. So yeah, this, this, I'll just sort of let this, these texts speak for themselves, but it de-silos data, it, the, the library of inspiration and the collection and archives are also de-siloed by living in situ with the Watermill Center, uh, the resident artists, uh, the gr grounds, the landscaping, the flowers, the trees, uh, birds and deer and deer fences and the center itself. Uh, new points of access will continually emerge through this integration of relationships between artis artistic production, archival data, and the Watermill Center. And uh, yes, I, I thank you. Thanks to Frank, Viola, Marcus, and Bob himself uh, for your patience with uh, a little technical delay at the beginning. Thank you.
uh, I sort of have uh, two questions, if that's all right. Uh, the, uh, I can hear you well, but I don't know about it. Um, is uh, the first thing is that earlier today we were speaking about like um, the sets and props being uh, thrown out uh, for productions. Oh, well, yeah. uh, one exception which I known about uh, as um, was that uh, the sets and the light plot uh, for the original Ice on a Beach were saved yeah. for the revival. Uh, are they still around, or were uh, they uh, disposed of after that? Oh, great question. So we do have some lighting plots and information and set design information in the Robert Wilson archives. There are also, a, there's something I didn't have time to get to because this was like the civil wars of a presentation trying to cram everything, everything into a, a one zone. But yeah, the uh, C Columbia University Rare Books and Manuscript Library also has additional material related to Einstein on the beach, including lighting plots and, and designs. And then Paula Cooper Gallery also has numerous Robert Wilson sketchbooks um, and uh, related to Einstein on the beach as well. So they're kind of, you know, it's a tripartite situation. Um, so you don't know what happened to the set? The sets, I'm not sure. Yeah, we, we don't have, we have some small maquettes, but we don't have the uh, original set design or the original set uh, objects. All right, oh. and uh, the second thing is I want to know about how you uh, work with uh, the, the theater and film and take archive where I know uh, the video recordings are, um, mm -hmm. especially in relation to the fact is that uh, they said they have uh, 17 uh, uh, tapes which they were not able to digitize. Yeah. I want to know how is like you work uh, with them and with digitization and like fixing things like thinking and that sort of thing. Yeah, so with, um, with NYPL, for example, there was a, uh, a monies were raised uh, by, in collaboration between NYPL and a great funder of, uh, of Robert Wilson's work to uh, start that digitization process. Um, there are certainly legal reasons that um, that garner access and, and you know especially factor into NYPL's access structure, which is a bit different than ours. So um, they certainly they went through a long process of di of a first pass of digitization many years ago, early 2000s, of a broad bank of video and um, audio materials. Some of that was redigitized recently, but I can't speak to you know given NYPL's funding and um, the perhaps collections that they need to focus on digitizing for other other projects or other purposes. What might usurp uh, what they can provide access to with respect to Robert Wilson's work? I hope that answers. I mean, I don't want to you know I don't want to throw anybody under the bus or get anybody in trouble either. Like I I know what I know about the about that process, but, but there are certainly things that, that factor in that I don't know about. Hi, thank you for letting us into the insight of how uh, Bob's archive is being made. I think about um, Merce Cunningham's archive, I yeah. think about Pina's, Bausch's archive, uh -huh. sure. and, and those projects, I know, that, I know that with Merce Cunningham they were thinking of how documentation was going to happen sure. before he passed away, but what's exciting about the work you're doing is that it's in process, as you said, it's active yeah. and, and Bob's um, engaged with it. So Adding I'm to just, it, et cetera, yeah. yeah, so I'm just wondering if, if you were thinking about some of the other archives uh, that have been created from, uh, that are surrounded by a singular artist's work and, and how, if there's dialogue between them at all or, or if there's something right. that's so distinct because this is a living process. Yeah, I mean, I, I th there's a lot of uh, trial and error. Um, I think, you know, with, with Bob and his work in this archive, um, there are, of course, things I would do differently had I, you know, had the opportunity to, to do it over again. Um, we don't often have that opportunity. So, yeah, there, like, I was not necessarily l looking towards a ton of other models, although I had been an archivist for years before uh, working with Bob in various various um, artistic and non-artistic settings, um, 
and almost exclusively dealing with archives of people who are no longer living. So this was my first real experience working uh, with an archive where somebody is very much alive and lets you know it <laughs> every day. So, which is great. I mean, I can also, you know, learn so much from that, but it does make it challenging that he's still producing work and reconfiguring things uh, and trying to restructure, uh, you know, aspects of the Watermill Center around the archives, like, like the dorm, former dorms where the archives now reside are below his, uh, his apartment at Watermill, so he is literally physically, you know, when he's on site above the archives, you know. So th just to say that there is, uh, there's been a lot of trial and error, and a lot of it was just looking at what Bob and his uh, collaborators and the sc scholarly community needed to try to structure this thing. It was very, it, it was organized before, but in a way that did not, uh, did not like make a, previous archivists did the best they could and I've done the best I could too, but that didn't really fit with what I saw as far as A, the Library of Inspiration Digital Archives Project and the scholarly needs that were, and collaborators needs that were coming out of, you know, the woodwork and then also like the fact that Bob's still, you know, a maniac in terms of creating new works and how to fit those into uh, a, a historical context as well. So yeah, I, it was a, yeah, it's a continually, uh, continual, continual project altered daily to use uh, Robert Morris's phrase, so. Thank you, exciting news about uh, the archive. Thank you. Um, so have all the materials that were stored in Bohemia already been cataloged and moved to Watermill? No, not yet. That's a great question, yeah. So there is still a, a, a bank of materials in, in Boho, as we call it. Um, we will, we're in the process of migrating that to Watermill for further attention. There are also records that are stored off-site that will probably always be off-site. They are so infrequently accessed, but there is not a real strong desire to also uh, discard them uh, that are reasonably well, reasonably okay in terms of their organization, like for example, boxes and boxes of faxes that Bob sends to, you know, people over the years. Um, it's very infrequently accessed, but there, there's always a chance that it may occur, so we want to just necessarily keep those. Um, whereas, for example, cor like typed correspondence that's a little bit better organized but still needs that final level of attention will be migrated to Watermill for a more focused processing and description. It's all been more or less. Um, yeah, we know. We we have we have um, we have a much clearer knowledge of what is now living at Watermill for you know direct attention. But we have you know lists of of basically at a series level what lives at Bohemia, but at a micro document level less so. I hope that I hope that helps. It's still a, you know a, a work in process. Yeah. So of course, it's really kind of you know historical precedent almost that a living artist has yep. an archive set up in his name um, regarding his own work. To what extent does Bob ever use the archive himself? He he uses it often. So there's that's a, 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 a multi uh, a few answers to that. So Bob will certainly go into the archives, um, and you know he's interested in the staging. I mean, like when we. Uh, when we started the process of the, the study center. Um, I, I was at a table workshop with, with him and Stephanie and Owen Laub and Noah Koshbin. I think Lauren DeGiulio was there, a few other people. Um, he started with, can we have an archive with nothing in it? <laughs> so I was like, are you just doing that to mess with me, Bob? Um, the jury's out. But he, he, you know, he certainly personally requests materials. Um, he'll email me um, or or call me or you know ask for usually a digital imagery of certain productions. Um, sometimes he wants to uh, you know access programs or or something like that. Um, the or stage staging sketches. Um, scholars are m much more interested in the in the nuts and bolts of like the. The, the A to Z process that he worked through. Um, he, he generally knows what he made, but he still not, likes to refer back to it. 
so yeah, I, like I or his collaborators um, will 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 deal with answering his questions about that. And he's a he's a constant yeah he's a constant researcher. So uh, he he certainly is interested in uh, also his art, researching his own art collection, um, and I think he researches his ar his archives in this in in a similar way. It's it's very much based on on visual sense. Um, and he has a mind like a steel trap, so he remembers how something looked, whether we have an image of it, that is not always the case. And um, you know, we, the archives, as much as we try to keep everything uh, and to collect everything, not everything makes its way to us. Theaters don't always send video, theaters don't always send images. Photographers may have like, missed, a, missed a section. Um, there's various reasons why we may or may not have materials, so we try to do to the best of our abilities, answer those requests from Bob and others. So. And what about digitization efforts? For example, the, the, the Bertolt Brecht archive in Berlin, of course, it's yeah. publicly funded. Right. Um, you yeah, know, yeah, they're exactly. on a multi-year, multi-million euro uh, project on yeah. digitizing hundreds of thousands of, you know, manuscripts. And uh, yeah. I mean, it's that also one of the reasons, of course, is to make that material available online so that right. you don't actually have to be at the archive in person necessarily and it allows for interlinking the material with yeah. other archives. Is there something like that in the works? We would love to have it more in the works. I mean, the funding is- It's expensive. Is, yeah, funding is where it all, it lives and dies by the, by the, by the, the dollar or the euro. So, I mean, we have had uh, a, an, an Andrew Mellon grant to process uh, physically the archives for a, for um, you know, this advanced level of metadata, but, you know, as far as digitizing imagery, it's been a bit piecemeal. Some things, like, we've, we've had these efforts to uh, digitize a, a broader uh, amount of material, but it always ends up being more expensive than we had hoped, and sometimes we have to scale back what we can actually do, but we're going to keep trying, you know? So uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a long, it's a long game. And uh, check back with us. We hope to have more digitized and more available soon. Last question. Thank you for, um, for your presentation. I have um, not a very pretty question, but uh, the sure. basic um, budget to run um, an archives of that dimension, what is it? <laughs> uh, you, yeah, I mean, <laughs> what do I want or what actually is it? I mean, what? Yeah, I mean, like, you could probably get by on like ten thousand a year with this. Um, we we through the Mellon Foundation, um, we were able to secure a hundred thousand over two years, which was great. Um, but you know, sometimes we do have to shrink those budgets. It all really, it really depends on you know what's available to us and what we can. Uh, try to get, but yeah, I mean, it has definitely been very, there have been very fallow years as well as very healthy years, so, yeah. Do you have any funding from uh, foreign countries? That's a great question. So the Library of Inspiration Project was initially funded through, uh, partly through a grant from uh, a, 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 a business, business vent, uh, person that Bob was close to. Um, and that, that was seed money to get that going. Um, so it has happened in the past, and hopefully, and certainly possibly it could again. I mean, there are some other um, people who are close to Bob that have donated money to the library, to the study center construction, things like that, but they're, they, um, they appear in various forms, shall we say, and I, you know, I don't wanna get too into like actual numbers and where things are coming from, you know, in terms of, you know, propriety and stuff like that. Um, but certainly uh, it, those, uh, those funding streams have appeared and um, as the work continues, we, we, we welcome and try to access that as much as we can, so. Thank you so much. Yeah, we could spend a whole day thank on you. this, I know, but I, thank you for letting me get, at least give the window to, to it. <laughs>